so thank you for joining me virtually this year. I'm so sorry that we can't be meeting in person, but I look forward to our Q&A. Uh, my name is Brianne Slocum. I'm a 2009 graduate of the Culinary Arts Program here at SUNY Delhi, And then I went to Johnson & Wales in Providence, Rhode Island, and I graduated with my master's in food service education. And I've been teaching at Delhi for about eight years. Um, and I love every second of it, and I love doing these extra demos as well. I'm so sorry we couldn't have some students join us today. Um, but the theme today is going to be falling in love with squash. So a little play on words. Um, inspiration for this demo was really going to the farmer's market and just, you know, with that first time that all the squash are out, you're like, what can I do with this? And typically, you see the roasted squashes, the soups. Um, maybe it's just like the acorn squash stuffed and baked. Um, I want to do a couple uh, different recipes that show variety within the squash. Um, so as you can see, um, there are about 11 main varieties of winter squash that we have available to us. Uh, acorn, buttercup, butternut, kabocha, spaghetti, pumpkin, Hubbard squash. Um, I always joke because with Hubbard squash, they can grow so large, it's almost like you need a chainsaw to get through them. It's almost impossible. Um, but I did see at my local farmer's market a smaller type of Hubbard squash um, that was a little bit easier to work with. And then I, I found a new variety and that was called a mashed potato squash and I was like, wait a second. Um, so mashed potato squash is just like a white variety of an acorn. This is an acorn squash. And then we have butternut, kabocha, and buttercup. So, and I thought to myself, okay, mashed potato squash, gnocchi, and then I searched online, and that's where we came across the winter squash gnocchi with a sage uh, brown butter sauce. Um, and the, the woman at the farmer's market said, you won't even tell the difference between a mashed potato and if you, if you roasted this or boiled it up and mashed it up. So that was my inspiration. Uh, besides that recipe, the butternut squash arancini. Arancini is just like, um, leftover risotto that you can deep fry and stuff with anything of your liking. So for that recipe, I have a sage derby cheese and I thought it appropriate because sage is like an affinity flavor to squash. They love each other. Um, and it kind of has these green striations in it that we'll see up close in a little bit. Um, it does leave a green color to the cheese in the middle, just so you know, so it's perfect for Halloween. And uh, the roasted squash soup, um, I'm going to be using the kabocha squash and the acorn squash for that. It gives it a really nice, um, really bright orange color. And then I wanted to go outside the box a little bit and do a raw squash uh, recipe. So I found an acorn squash slaw and it's just tenderized by a little bit of the vinaigrette that we're going to be making. So those are the four recipes. We're going to dive right in to starting out making risotto. And if you've never made risotto before, um, you want to make sure you have a little bit of time and make extra so you can eat it fresh with something and then have um, the leftovers to make these arancini. So to start risotto, we're just going to have a little butter and a little um, onion and we're going to sweat that down. So sweating versus sauteing is just softening the onion just a little bit. Um, and then it, it, it'll blend itself, the extra butter that's in there. We're going to just coat our arborio rice. Arborio our our rice is just an Italian rice variety, and it's a short grain rice. And you can actually see the little pockets of white starch that are in there. Um, and then as you cook it low and slow in the presence of liquid, it releases its own starch, and that's where you end up with a really nice creamy finished um, consistency. And depending on how much you make, I've made this quite a bit. So um, technique-wise, it stays the same. Measurements, though, when you deal with rice, um, you're talking about a ratio of liquid to the grain. Um, and for this, it's about, if you have a cup of rice, three and a half to four cups of liquid. Um, so you can kind of gauge what you're going to add to that from that ratio. So after you coat your rice in the butter, my first addition of liquid is white wine. Any white cooking wine, um, you know the rule of thumb is if you won't drink it, why would you cook with it? So a nice white wine. If you are cooking over an open flame, just add your alcohol. 
off of the plate. And then this is a technique where you do have to kind of wash it every now and again. You don't want the, the rice to get dry on you, but it is a stirred technique versus maybe you're familiar with cooking pilaf. Um, that, you do not stir it. It just kind of cooks either on the stove top or in the oven to finish. This, you finish right directly on the heat as you stir. So with any alcohol, you want to uh, reduce that by half. So you can see that already the arborio rice is letting go of some of that starch as the wine is reducing down. You want to be careful not to boil it out too fast. You want to make sure that it's about like a 15, between, depending on how much you make, a good 15 to 15 minutes to a half an hour to finish this cooking process. But like all good television shows, the miracle of TV, we have some done for you. All right, so when it gets to right about this consistency, you're going to want to add your liquid. Now, while I was making the soup and I had all this stuff going on, I was like, what liquid am I going to use? So I decided to use the ends of some of the butternut squash um, and just cook it down, and then I blended it. So it's a little bit soupy, but I made like butternut squash infused water. Um, so it's vegetarian in that sense, and I salted it slightly, and it gives a really awesome orange color. So about two ladles just to start, just enough to cover the amount of rice that you have in your pan. And then you'll just get that started. So at this point, you can kind of walk away from it to finish this. Once the rice is al dente, and what, what that means is it, it has a bite to it. It's not mushy and it's not raw, it doesn't stick to your teeth. You're going to finish it with some Parmesan cheese and probably what some might consider way too much butter, but just enough butter for some. Um, salt and pepper, and then since the, the sage derby cheese, it's only slightly infused with sage, um, I'm gonna add fresh sage to it. And this is just the type of cheese that I found um, I thought it was neat because it was flavored, but like I said, maybe thinking back on it, I might have done just a straight, like, even like a goat cheese might be nice in this, and then flavor it myself with some of the fresh sage. Um, sage, if you're not familiar with it, it's an herb that is a relative of the mint. It's in the mint family, and it's kind of fuzzy on the outside. These are small sage leaves, and I already, um, I deep fried them, but you can kind of see they're really tasty. Some are uh, bigger than others, but I just chop some up into a small dice that I can um, add to my finished risotto. So you have to add your liquid to this risotto in stages. Once it has reduced down, the liquid has evaporated out some of it, the, the rice has started to swell in the presence of the liquid, it's absorbed some of that liquid, you're going to add your next addition to it. And what I'll do is I will show you some that I have. So you can see leftover risotto, it had it's bound so you can scoop it out. And just to make sure people knew what type of risotto I made, I small diced some butternut squash which you can see right in the mix, and I folded it in. Because squash has a very mild flavor. Um, it really lends itself to what uh, other flavors that you have. Yes, with the soup, with the kabocha or the, um, the buttercup squash, it's a little bit more distinct in flavor, but butternut is pretty mild. So what you're gonna do after you finish eating your risotto the day of, pour out whatever you have left onto a parchment paper lined sheet tray, cool it in the fridge overnight, and then you'll be able to scoop it like this. The next addition of liquid, and you'll probably end up doing the additions of liquid to it three or four times until it's the proper consistency. 
I already made these arancini. And in the middle of them, you put your cheese or anything else that you would like to stuff the arancini with. But it's a nice surprise when you break them open. You could also serve this with um, an aioli, which would be nice. It's just like a mayo-based sauce. You could infuse that with some sage as well. But you're going to make a little patty, and you're going to take some of the cheese, whatever you have, put it in the center, and then encase it. I changed my scoop sizes, as you can see. The other ones were a little bit big. But these are good like hors d'oeuvre size if you had a little dinner party, and very seasonal. So after you mix some of those up, you just bread them and then you can fry them. You should your fryer oil. Um, I know many people don't have a deep fryer in their homes. Um, if you're if you do, awesome, you're lucky. But you want your fryer oil to be about 350. You can go 360 because when you add the arancini to it, it's going to drop the temperature down. You can use panko breadcrumb, which is a Japanese style breadcrumb, or you can use just standard breadcrumbs, which I have here today. And when ready to do it, a standard breading procedure is flour, egg, and then your breadcrumb. And of course, you should always maintain a dry hand, wet hand, but that never works out. So I have some gloves on just in case. And depending on the size that you make your arancini, you might have to throw them in the oven just to finish melting the cheese a little bit. Um, sometimes with the bigger one, I found that the inside just wasn't melted through enough. So that's going to be dependent on the size you make them. Be careful not to drop them into the hot oil. So just kind of place in. And then when your fry oil is the right temperature, you should be able to see them start to bubble. So just be careful when you're doing this in your own home though, that you choose a pot that is big enough that when you put the arancini in, it's not going to like bubble up the oil and then you have a big spill on your hand. This fancy tool is called a spider, but any slotted spoon would work. And after they come out, anything that comes out of the fryer, you're going to want to hit it with some salt. Um, and then I thought for just a garnish, I would do some of the fried sage leaf on top so people knew what flavor profile was uh, in the actual component. And typically the telltale sign of them, the cheese being melted in the middle is a nice golden brown exterior. So with the risotto right here, you know when to add another hit of the liquid when you start to see the rice grains kind of coming through and you want to make sure that the rice is always coated with liquid. Now the one thing about squash in general, it's very starchy. So even by using this liquid, it's probably going to like reduce down. Um, and I like the consistency that the final product gave. I almost feel like it was creamier, um, than, which is amazing because risotto is creamy anyway from the amount of butter and, and cheese that you put in it. But it just helped the mouthfeel of it a little bit. So I'm going to grab these out.
hit them with a little salt. And if you had a little bit of that aioli or a little butternut squash sauce or something to that effect, you could put them on there. And I'm sure the lovely ladies that are helping me videotape today will enjoy them. I'll be able to answer your questions during the Q&A a little bit about that process if you still have questions about that. But what we're going to do now is the winter squash gnocchi. And if you've ever made potato gnocchi before, you know it can be very temperamental. Um, if you've never made it before, um, it can be temperamental. Uh, so it's dependent on the amount of liquid that your potato has in it, especially because we introduce squash to the mix. Squash is very watery or can be depending on the variety. And I had never used the mashed potato squash before, the white acorn variety. Um, it had a lot of extra liquid, water, moisture in it. So I found myself in the recipe having to add way more flour than I originally thought. But the consistency you want is like pizza dough. Still a little tacky, but it still holds together. So in the recipe, it's going to have you bake off your potato. It's going to have you bake off your uh, mashed potato squash, and you just poke some holes in it. And it's a, it's an effort to get all the moisture to escape in the oven. If you boiled it, you would be introducing moisture in there, and it just wouldn't work as good. So after you bake your potato off, the recipe will also say run it through a food mill, um, run it through a ricer, and if you've never used a potato ricer before, or if you don't have the luxury of having one at home, most of us have a strainer of some kind. So you can scoop the inside of the potato into your strainer, because the, the end result, we want it to be a very, very smooth potato puree. If you had a food mill, like I said, that would work as well. And then after you do your potato, you would then do your winter squash. And also your recipe calls for roasted garlic. Hopefully you can see that. It's coming right through. So it's just a little chef cheat method here. You can do this with your potatoes on a normal basis, and then you can add um, you can do this even if you were making mashed potatoes and you did boil your potatoes. You can pass them through this and then add cream and butter and make the most smooth mashed potatoes you probably have ever had in your life. So after we do that, we're just going to go to the other side. So I'm going to kind of move forward with this process because I made this dough last night. Um, but imagine potato, squash, roasted garlic, in, in your recipe, the ricotta cheese, um, egg yolks, and flour. And then you can season it um, to taste as well. So when you bake it, you can make it a day in advance like I did. Don't be afraid to knead it. You don't want to make it too gummy and too dense, but you want it to hold together like a dough would. And then, to make your gnocchi, you're going to roll it out into a log shape. And you might need some extra flour. To help you do that. So if you ever made pretzels before, it's like rolling out pretzels before you twist them. And then I, I found that with traditional potato gnocchi, you can shape it on the back of a fork, or you can use the gnocchi um, wooden paddle. This is just a little too sticky for that. So even in the recipe, it says just to cut them into like half inch sections. We're going to go right to our water, 
and we're going to let these poach. You want your water to be at a simmer before you put them in. Because then, just like the oil, it's going to lower the temperature down. And you want to make sure that they poach up good for you. And it's okay if they have a little bit of um, flour around the outside of them. So after you poach them, you can make these in advance, or if you made too many, if the recipe made too many for what you needed for that night, um, you can freeze them. And that goes for regular gnocchi as well. And I did salt this water prior to putting them in. I did notice with the mashed potato squash, it is very, very mild. So it also needed um, quite a bit of salt added to the recipe. And a little granulated garlic because the fresh roasted garlic um, just didn't sink through enough for it. So as I have the rest of my mise en place, and that's a fancy French culinary term for everything in its place, you want to make sure that you're prepared with an oiled parchment paper pan that when they come out, you can put them right on there. And then what we're going to do is just a quick saute with some brown butter and some fresh sage and maybe a little bit of this poaching liquid to create like a nice sauce around them. And that'll be it. So this one, it is a little bit more advanced of a technique just to make sure that you form the dough appropriately. But once you get the knack of it, if you made them in advance to pull them out, it's just a different type of recipe that um, incorporates squash to it that you wouldn't normally think to add it in there. And I like the idea of the ricotta cheese in there. It gives it a little bit more moisture. Um, but I also like the uh, ricotta nubi, if you've ever had that, and that's a dumpling that's made specifically with ricotta cheese um, with flour and egg added to it. So we're going to let those kind of rise to the top for a moment. regular potato gnocchi, but once you heat them up in the brown butter, they come back to life a little bit. So when you make brown butter, you're just going to take regular whole butter, um, salted or unsalted is your preference, just know that you're going to have to control um, the amount of salt that you add to your finished product for if you use salted butter. But you're going to take the whole butter and you're just going to let that brown the milk solids that are still in that butter. And this is like a very traditional accompaniment, if you will, to a lot of different squash dishes. Brown butter and sage, it's like a happy marriage. So you can kind of see that bubble. It does take a moment. And don't use a nonstick pan for that process because you won't be able to see the solids get to the proper color. Which they are now. So if you can see this, you can see that it's getting brown on the bottom of the pan. The butter is just getting that kind of brown like hazelnut kind of color to it and it smells nutty. We're going to add in our gnocchi and I have parsley. Parsley in the dough is that little green color that it gives it. And I'll just add in some of the fresh ones that I just pulled out. And give them a toss and it's okay if they get a little bit of color on them. In my trial of cooking them it, gave, it was a nice contrast 
to the texture of the inside of them. And then once they've sauteed a little bit, I'm going to hit them with a little salt. I use unsalted butter, so that's why I can kind of control the salt a little bit. A little pepper. Some fresh sage. It's very potent. It's very strong. It's just like if you've used mint before. And you can't smell it, but it's very, very um, nice herbaceous smell. I'm going to take a little bit of the cooking liquid. And I'm going to add it. And you can see that it makes a little bit of a sauce to it. Just a little bit, a little brown butter sauce. And you can finish with some Parmesan cheese too if you want it. So that is our second dish here. I'll put that there. And flavor profiles to that base recipe but what I have here these are just the raw squash varieties I wanted you to see it this is the kabocha squash you can see the color that it gets this was just previously roasted in the butter cup and I don't know if you can see this but the moisture content in this one versus the um, butter cup the butter cup is drier okay so that's something to consider when you're adding things in the recipes as well but what I'm going to do is take this is a Vitacrep from the Vitamix company. It's like the most powerful blender that you can have. Um, and it's going to make really, really smooth purees. So you're going to take the roasted squash right into the blender. And in essence, we're going to make a little baby food. But we're going to make it I was actually very shocked at the different amount of moisture. This is my first time really experimenting with buttercup squash, but I think the balance of the two lend itself really well to this soup. Now the key to making a perfectly smooth puree like this is don't add too much liquid to it. And you can add vegetable stock, you can add chicken stock. But the beauty of doing a few things with squash is you have extra liquid available. This is what I did when I made the soup that I'm going to show you in a moment. This is just some of the liquid that I used for the um, butternut squash risotto. I'm going to pop that on. And just maybe halfway up, just enough. If you didn't roast the squash, you could boil the squash. But when you do that, just put enough water or vegetable stock just to barely cover your squash before you start to boil it and simmer it to get tender. Because again, you think you need to add it all. And I'll show you the texture of the finished um, soup and you'll know why. So it be noisy for a minute. Coconut milk, though. This is a big 
going to see that in my So you can see with the consistency of this soup right here, this is just the squash puree and the little coconut milk. And it's like the perfect consistency right now. Um, and vegan. There's nothing else that the squash needs to get this consistency because it's already starchy enough and it holds its um, texture really well. So to this, I'm just going to add a little bit of coconut milk. it up just like this. This is more uh, warm through than this one is, but I kept it very simple. Just some salt, some pepper. Um, you could garnish with some cilantro and lime if you wanted to go that route. But what I did was so what I did was I took some um, some pumpkin seeds, pepitas if you will, and I toasted them with some cumin, some salt, some cayenne pepper, and it adds a little crunch to the soup. So when you're ready to serve it to whomever gets the benefit, So this recipe I found is one of the very few acorn raw uh, raw squash um, recipes I could find, but I was intrigued by it um, because it's different. As, like I said earlier, everybody can roast squash and you can stuff acorn squash. I grew up with a pat of butter and brown sugar and you throw it in the oven and you roast it. And yes, it's delicious, but sometimes you want something lighter um, and a different type of side dish for the holidays that are coming up. So. I thought this one was a winner, and it does taste really, really nice. This is a mandolin. Uh, you can get really good julienne strips really easily by using this, but I know a lot of you might have a food processor that has the, um, the, I guess, the grating tool on top that you could then make slaw out of, and you can do that julienne cut as well. So if you are going to use a mandolin for this process, just please make sure that you are safe when you do this. So I have a cut glove here. And all I did was just a section just like this, and you can see the end result here. It yielded that much slaw. 
So you don't need a lot to make, you don't need a big section to make quite a bit of slaw. And then I'll talk to you about the vinaigrette in a moment. So what I did, because peeling the, the squash ends, it's a little bit fibrous, and that's another thing. You have to be careful when you cut through the squash. It tends to be very tricky, and your knife could kick out on you, so just be careful. But instead of using a peeler for this process, I found that just taking your knife very carefully around the edge was a, just a better way to go about peeling this. Because it does have those kind of wavy sections to it. I found that I've never really attempted to eat acorn squash raw until I discovered this recipe. Um, but it does have like an inherent sweetness to it that of course comes out more when it is cooked. But this vinaigrette recipe has a rice wine vinegar, has some lemon juice, um, it has brown sugar, regular granulated sugar, and craisins in it, the dried cranberries. So it, it actually tenderized it a little bit and I think it brought out the sweetness of the acorn squash as well. So you can see that I'm always cutting away from myself. You want to make sure that you are very, very careful if you do it like this. But I don't think eating the outside of the squash would be as tasty. So we want to make sure that we get all of that off. And then another little trick that I have, to make an emulsified vinaigrette, and this is very light on the olive oil per the recipe, but if you put it into a container, oil and vinegar, uh, oils and vinegar don't mix, so you can see that the oil floats to the top. This will never create a permanent emulsion, like think of mayo in that sense, it won't separate for you. This is like a very light vinaigrette, so it will separate, but if you use a container with a lid, right before you dress your slaw, you can give it a shake, and then drizzle it right over. A little salt helps balance the sweetness, and craisins. And I just chopped them a little bit coarse. And also there was scallion in this recipe, but I could see this as a blanket recipe, meaning if you wanted to maybe make a squash black bean taco and you wanted to make this into a little bit more of a savory application without the craisins in it, you could add your cilantro and your limes to it and it would be just a very interesting topper. Even though it has a lot of vinegar and lemon juice in it, the squash holds up and it holds its texture really nicely. Um, and again, just a kind of a different side dish um, to put at your table at, at the holiday season. So that is our fourth recipe. So I was going to be overly ambitious and try to do um, a dessert for you, 
I grew up eating squash pies and things of that nature and kind of staying away from the traditional pumpkin pie, but I decided to stick with these four. It gives you variety um, for your holiday table. So I look forward to working with you and talking to you during the Q&A session, and I just really appreciate you tuning in and joining us for this.